All right, so Dr. Chris Salerno is a general dentist from Long Island, New York. He graduated from Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine in 2005. Dr. Salerno has served at, as the national president of ASDA, chair of the ADA New Dentist Committee, and as president of his local dental society. He lectures internationally on clinical dentistry and practice management. He has been the chief editor of Dental Economics since 2014. Let's all give a warm welcome to Dr. Salerno. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. Sorry for the delay, technical issues on my end. Uh, we still have plenty of time to get through this information. And uh, I, this is super important. This is honestly, this is the thing that freaked me out the most when I was a dental student. And honestly, the first few years as a practicing dentist too, is how to talk about dental needs to patients. I was really nervous about it. I think part of it for me too was just not being super confident in the dentistry I was able to provide. Like, I'm like, you need a filling. I'm like, I've done three of them. What am I talking about, right? But uh, I wanna show you that as you build your clinical skills, you will naturally build your presentation skills as well. I wanna be very clear. This is not about selling dentistry. I don't hate the word sell. I, I think that it has a negative, you know, kind of connotation there, but uh, selling, we can learn a lot of lessons from, from the greater sales uh, uh, institutions out there. But in the end, I, we're, we're not trying to manipulate uh, uh, our patients into anything. That, that's not what we're doing here when, when I talk about how to do a proper case presentation. What we're doing is simply helping people take them on a little journey to better understand what is exactly going on in their mouths because they certainly don't know. It's up to us to tell them. Unless they're in a lot of pain or unless they see something that's broken or looks ugly, they don't know, right? Uh, and so we have to help them find their motivation to get this dentistry done because we we know it's in their best interest. Um, so that's what we're going to be discussing today. Now I am supposed to be able to control. Let's see. I'm looking around here, but I'm not controlling this. Oh, there we go. Yes, I am indeed. All right. So here are the basics. If you've seen me lecture at the National Leadership Conference for ASDA, you may be familiar with this concept I was discussing that we should stop trying to be as dental practices. We should stop trying to be everything to everyone and try to be something really special to certain groups of people. And that, as it turns out, is not just a good business model. That is the first part of better case presentation is who are you talking to in the first place? I look at this uh, attract, connect and deliver as, as my kind of marketing case presentation little, little thought piece here. First, attract. Am I attracting the right people to my practice? If you want to be delivering lots of full arch, high-end implant reconstructions, then maybe the best marketing ploy isn't to go into a penny saver and have little coupons you can cut out that say $10 off your cleaning. That's not really going to be welcoming the right type of person for full arch $20,000 implant reconstructions, right? I mean, yeah, those, those people that read penny savers and cut out coupons might certainly need those that care and maybe they'll spring for it. But the person who's motivated by, you know, the, the, the least expensive uh, pathway to get their dentistry done is probably not the person who's going to lay out $20,000, right? Makes sense. So make sure that we are attracting the right kind of person for the care we wanna to provide to our practice. Everyone deserves great dentistry and there are many different business models to deliver that care, but make sure we're bringing in the people that are more likely to say yes to the kinds of care that we want to deliver. By the way, if you wanna do a, a, a nice blue collar family practice, then totally put those ads in the penny savers because that is the right type of person for that type of practice. Next is connect. Here's where the magic happens and where we'll spend some time discussing this uh, in our session today is how do we help them understand their dental needs? How do we help someone understand, hey, you have a cavity and you need a filling? Well, yeah, most people will say, sure, okay, I'll, I'll schedule that filling. But for the, those who struggle with it for different reasons that we'll discuss, what the obstacles to treatment are, we'll find, I think, that when you can connect what motivates them as a person, as a human being on this planet, when you can connect that to their oral health, you'll have a better go. At, at helping them understand the importance of their oral health. It can't be done all the time, but it's, it's a, a, a communication technique. 
It's not manipulative at all. It's a communication technique that I've used many times and that has helped. And we'll do some examples of that. And then finally, deliver unforgettable service along the way. Uh, that just kind of goes without saying, if you're mean and rude and your, your staff, your team are, are you know, uh, abrasive and, and rude, then you're gonna have a tough time convincing patients that they need to have dentistry done in this setting, right? Um, and this begins well before you even meet the patient. We'll discuss that. There are multiple impression opportunities, multiple times where a patient starts to get a sense of who we are and what kind of practice they're going to be into. And this begins again before we even meet them. Step one, the marketing. We talked about, about a bit about that, that very important first phone call when they call and say, hi, I'm a new patient. I'd love to come see you. Third, how they are received when they walk in the door, a critical 30 seconds to a minute of, of impressionable activities that, again, they still haven't met us. It's typically the front desk team that's going to be meeting them. And boy, there's a lot of ways they can mess that one up or, or knock it out of the park. Fourth, the exam. Now, here's where they're finally meeting us, right? There's three impression opportunities before we even get to meet this patient. And so there's a lot of opportunity to get it right and a lot of opportunity to get it wrong. Well, well, finally, we conduct our exam and the way in which we do so, of course, still is an impression opportunity. Then the uh, consultation. Now we're actually discussing with them the kind of care that they need. This is done in one of two settings as I'll be discussing. The first setting is the real quick hygiene check, right? So when you get out in private practice, you have a hygienist who's doing hygiene, you're gonna pop in in between working on your own patients and hi, nice to meet you, how's it going? I'm the new guy or gal on the block. Nice to meet you. And you're gonna you know, do your exam. And then if you find anything, you'll, you'll share. Yeah, it looks like we have a little cavity here and you'll, you'll explain that, right? Well, again, the majority of the time patients say, sounds good and they'll schedule that appointment and it gets done. But there's another type of consultation appointment that we should really make use of. This is uh, no doubt something you've, you've done quite a bit of in the academic setting that you're in right now. But my goodness, it is a super important one, even when you get out into the real world. That is setting up a separate consultation visit. And you're thinking, yeah, we have to do that for a multidisciplinary complex care, really expensive care. Yeah, there's other times we need to do it too. So when I'm walking to that hygiene room, I'm thinking, is this someone that I can help understand their oral health needs right here, right now? Or do we need to set up a separate appointment? And how we pivot, how we make that decision is, is not only an impression opportunity, but a, a, an excellent pathway to getting this person to understand properly what needs to be done. And finally, the treatment, right? I mean, if we do all these things right, but uh, I'm terrible at, at delivering anesthesia and I'm, I'm nasty to my, my dental assistant throwing instruments everywhere, I, I'm ruining that, that, that patient impression. I may have done that dentistry today, but they uh, rightly so may never come back. These are some of the impression opportunities. And if we do this correctly for our patients over and over again, we've built the trust, we've built the confidence. When we tell them, hey, I've noticed these things are going wrong with your oral health, they're more likely to say, well, yeah, I trust you. I have great experience here. We're good to go. So it's a lot more than just what you can say to a patient to get them to say yes to treatment, right? I hopefully I've explained that. We're gonna jump into, uh, because this is a shorter session, we're gonna just jump right into the exam. Only a couple words I wanna say about this. We're then gonna spend the rest of the time talking about this all important consultation visit. Uh, one thing that I think uh, many dentists miss is how we can make the patient more comfortable in the setting. Now, this is a nice modern dental operatory and, and uh, this is my uh, operatory for my practice and it was brand new equipment, uh, but we have to acknowledge patients still hate this, right? Like we dentists look and go, ooh, ah, a deck chair, how nice. But patients just hate walking into any of these environments. We can put all the green shrubbery around here we want. Uh, we can have Netflix playing on the TV. Yeah, those things are nice. They still hate being in the dental chair. Let's acknowledge that. But what I really want to show is we can begin to help patients understand what we're finding in their mouth in more ways than one. One of the most important additions I had to my practice, as you can see right in the center of the screen there, is a screen. A, a, now there's a computer monitor for me on the other end of the operatory there at the 12 o'clock position, but I have a screen for patients. Yeah, it shows television so they can zone out and watch TV while we're working, but I can hit a button and it flips over so they can see my monitor. I want patients to see exactly what I'm seeing because it, as they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. 
You should absolutely be using intraoral cameras if they're available in your program. Um, I remember we had one in my dental school, but it was like you had to sign out for it and it, you wheeled it out on a cart and it took 10 minutes out of the appointment. Not super practical as a system, right? But in your private practice setting, hopefully you'll be able to have an intraoral camera that's just hung up right next to you that you can grab just as easy as you grab your handpiece. I have uh, hi one hygienist in particular who does this quite often, she'll even use the intraoral camera in place of a dental mirror. So she'll walk around with her Explorer and her intraoral camera instead of her mirror and Explorer. Isn't that interesting? So that her and the patient are looking together at the examinations. Now you really need a nice high resolution camera for that, but boy, that, that works great. I, I think it's an interesting idea. One of the things that I say to my team as a kind of as a, 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 a little a, a mnemonic here is I'd love to have at least one intraoral camera picture on a patient per visit. I'd love to give me one. If everyone's, if the teeth are totally gleaming and perfect and beautiful, take a picture of their gorgeous smile. I don't care. But as a loose, fast rule, just get me a, a picture of something. If there's something like this, where we see that some tooth structure is broken away, the patient may be completely unaware of this, but my gosh, when you sh actually show them what's going on here, I haven't even walked in the room yet. I haven't said a darn thing. They look at this, what their hygienist just showed them and say, oh my gosh, what is that? What are we, what are we gonna do about this, right? That's effective communication. I've shown them what's actually going on in that dark hole in their head, and we've already started a conversation. And by the way, we'll show things all the time where we just see little cracks and all the restorations. And I say, yeah, you know what? This is just us keeping track of this and documenting this. We don't have to do anything about this right now. You know, yeah, at some point we might want to jump in and do a restoration as we see this breaks down further. But, you know, we're just seeing a little signs of wear and tear. That's okay. We're going to monitor that for you. That builds that confidence because I'm showing them I'm seeing a little early sign of a thing. Nothing we need to do anything about now, but we're on top of it. Don't you worry. We'll, we'll stay tuned. Showing people that I'm not doing dentistry is a very important point, I think, towards building that confidence. And in a case like this, of course, there is enamel that's broken away, and we are going to recommend treatment in this case. So I, this is a loose rule. We'll ask my hygienist to take at least a at least one photo, just capture that record there, or even live video. Intro cameras are super, super inexpensive, by the way. You can get really inexpensive ones for less than 50 bucks. So even if you go out and associate somewhere in some practice and they don't have intraoral cameras, oh my gosh, uh, see if you can pick one up for yourself and, and have it integrate into your imaging software. It's the best 50 bucks you'll ever spend. If you really wanna upgrade your, your game and as a student, you probably can get some pretty sweet discounts uh, right now, uh, or even as a resident, there are a couple of manufacturers Get a Canon, get an icon, doesn't matter. Uh, the real important stuff are the ring flashes and, and the telephoto lenses that you can use. I'm not a, a photography expert. Talk to people like Adamo Notor Antonio and these other great folks uh, who are, 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 thanks to Instagram, we can see some ridiculously beautiful uh, uh, photography that's being done by dentists these days. But more importantly, just from a, a, a patient communication standpoint, especially if I have a more complex case, a cosmetic case, I'm taking a series of photographs that are going to be displayed for a consultation visit. Um, you don't, you know, you can upgrade your game, and and this is not, these are not photos I'm taking on patients uh, all the time. This is just uh, uh, now and then for those big cases. Okay, I wanted to just spend a moment on that, um, you know, how we can make that that uh, treatment planning visit, uh, that that examination visit, a little more comfortable for patients because I haven't even started convincing patients of anything yet. I haven't even tried to explain any care. But by showing them the, their x-rays on a monitor that's right in front of them, by showing them intraoral photographs on a monitor right in front of them, we've already started a conversation. Okay, now look, the vast majority of the time, our case presentations are going to be what I call simple as opposed to complex. Simple, we need to fit all three criteria here. All three have to be met. One, it has to be a pretty straightforward treatment plan. A couple of cavities means a couple of fillings. That's pretty simple to me, right? And it's simple for your patients to understand. We don't have many options. Well, we could do an implant or a bridge and then, well, gee, we could do a partial that hangs up. Okay, that's not a simple treatment plan, right? So that already is going to kick it over into the more complex variety. <coughs> Pardon me. Next, it also has to be a basic financial plan. 
What I mean by that is, uh, you know, that's a different number for different folks. I'll put it this way, if, if this treatment plan is gonna cost $20,000, yeah, yeah, that's probably not so basic. But if this is a few hundred dollars, even a few thousand dollars in, in out-of-pocket expenses, co-insurance payments, et cetera, uh, and it's relatively straightforward, then yeah, it can be broken up into visits. Your treatment coordinator or office manager or whomever's discussing this can come in and say, yeah, you know what? It's, uh, it's gonna be total $1,500. We'll break it up into a few visits care credit, whatever they're gonna be presenting to the patient, that's still basic, it's still simple. The patient hasn't raised objections, we're good to go. And finally, it requires basic persuasion. What I mean by that is, if I say to someone, hey, you've got some cavities here, uh, don't worry, you see you see the little, little decay there? Yep, that's that decay, that little dark spot right there. Well, don't worry, it's not too deep. This is a this is a medium size uh, filling that we'll, we would do here. Everything's gonna be great. The patient looks at that and says, yeah, that sounds good. I'm like, okay, great. I walk out of the room, they're scheduled. That's basic persuasion. If you start to hear objections, and we'll go through different types of objections, objections in a little bit, but if you start to hear objections, well, now we need more advanced persuasion. We have to actually do some work to help this person understand their needs. So again, you need all three of these checked, and this is a simple case presentation. This can be done while the patient's sitting in the hygiene chair, you run back to finishing your molar endo in the other room, all is well with the world. That's the vast majority of, of cases. The next bit though, and it looks like the animations aren't working. Let me see here. No, the, we lost the animations in the uh, translation there, no worries. Well, uh, as you can imagine, the complex version is if any one of these isn't met. It could be a basic treatment plan and a basic financial plan, but if the patient's like, nah, I'm not interested, well, now this is complex. It could be, uh, I'll give you an example. I once had a, uh, a patient who was a physician, uh, and notoriously physician, physicians, physicians could be very difficult patients. I had a patient who, um, you know, a new patient walked in to see him and he, uh, he had a mouth full of cavities. I mean, he was bombed out. It was atrocious in there. And I was like, yeah, I showed him the x-rays, doing the whole song and dance and while he's sitting in the hygiene chair, he's just at his cleaning. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So as you can see here, we got some decay here, decay here, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm going through the whole thing. Nice, gentle terminology. And uh, at the end, I said, so, you know, good news. We'll get this all cleaned up for you. I think it'll just take a couple of visits. We'll be really efficient. Be a piece of cake. And the physician, my patient, goes, yeah, yeah, I could, uh, I'll just come back from my next cleaning. It'll be all right. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? Just, you're a doctor. I'm thinking, like, oh, you should know better, right? This is an example of not basic persuasion. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward dream plan. He's a doctor. I'm sure he can afford the $20 co-insurance payments per filling uh, that he was afforded, but uh, there's some more work I need to do to convince him of, uh, of the value of his care. Certainly, if you have uh, large, uh, large cases, full arch reconstructions, are we doing partials and saving this tooth? And but, 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 there's a lot of options. And never, never, please, please do not feel pressured by anyone, uh, by your future employers or anyone to have to diagnose and treatment plan a case properly in the three minutes that you're in the room doing a hygiene check. That's bonkers. Take your diagnostic information, uh, have the hygienist bring in some, some alginate material so you can take some study models, uh, bring out your fancy camera to take some more advanced photography. And then here's what I say to this person. When I see that we need to pivot and go to a separate consultation, I say, listen, we're at a crossroads here. We're at a crossroads here. I know there's a lot going on and, and I've started to explain some of these things to you. You know, I'd like to get a little more diagnostic information here. I'm gonna take a couple more camera pictures and we're gonna take some study models. I'd like to bring you back in a week. And that's gonna give me some time to, to do some homework for you and put together some options and, and we'll figure out together uh, I think what what the ne the best next steps are going to be. Now, there's no charge for that visit. Uh, your consultation is free. I never charge patients to discuss their well-being. So, I'd love to see you in a week. Just be a half hour of your time. Let's put our heads together. That's it. That's what I say. I never have patients say no to that, especially because I'm not charging them for this consultation. 
And truly, genuinely, I mean, in some of these more complex cases, I need a few days to, to look at everything and properly diagnose and treatment plan, right? That, that's, that's to be understood. What you can also do is start to ask the patient a little bit about where they might want to go. So for example, a case where you might have the extracting teeth and is it a fixed case or a movable case, implants, blah, blah, blah. you can start to just ask, hey, before I let you go though, I'm just curious, I'm gonna present some options to you. Let's, I, my job is to help narrow them down. Uh, you have a lot of options, options are great. It's great to have options. I wanna help narrow them down for you. Uh, just curious, if I were to present options for you at our consultation visit next week that involve a removable solution, something that replaces the teeth that comes in and out. Uh, is that something you're interested in? Or do you want me to only focus on options that are fixed in place, you can't take them out, and uh, more akin to natural teeth? Something like that, right? And you'll be surprised because I've had patients say, oh, removable? No, 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 no. Don't even say that word around me. Great. I don't have to waste time working that up in the treatment plan. I don't have to waste time explaining those options to them next time. So we can start to cut things out a little bit. But for these more complex cases, I try not to get into the weeds too much. Let me do my homework properly and meet them next time in a more comfortable setting. So quick example, uh, here you see a, a bite wing radiograph and you see some areas of decay, right? A little, little areas here and there. Is this simple or is this complex? If they just had say five cavities, is it simple or complex? The answer is, it depends on the person, right? I just gave you an example of a physician who had a similar uh, mouth, actually it was a little worse than this. And it's, it's pretty straightforward from a treatment plan standpoint, some fillings. It's pretty straightforward from a financial standpoint for, for a lot of folks these days, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, I see what it's gonna cost. I may need to break it out into a bunch of visits and, and take some time to, to, to be able to afford it, but it's understandable, these numbers. But if the person attached to these teeth doesn't care, uh, then it is a complex case. So I, I wanna, I, I show this bite wing to just illustrate the point that whether a case is simple or complex isn't always dependent on the dentistry that needs to be done. There's the person that is attached to these teeth as well. It's like this, is this simple or complex? I'll answer it for you right off the bat, complex. There's no way I'm gonna try to diagnose and treatment plan this person in the three minutes that I'm in the room uh, after they've had their cleaning done. No way. We see problems with the plane of occlusion, multiple missing teeth. Uh, oh gosh, you name it, right? What I'm just looking to do in the consultation visit is gauge their interest to do more. So if this person comes in for a cleaning and they're like, yeah, everything's great. And if their x-rays show they're generally in good health, you know, we can see a little area of decay here and there, but uh, generally in good health and they're comfortable. Well, yeah, I'd love to talk to them about what I'm seeing going on here and I'll do that. But I need to gauge whether or not they're interested in, in making any definitive changes moving forward. Now, here's a patient that came in as an emergency and they broke a veneer. I always love seeing chipped veneer on my new patient emergencies because uh, it rarely is actually a chipped veneer. It's usually a whole something else. So this person comes in, yeah, I need a new veneer. Now, looking at the where looking at the super eruption of the mandibular incisors, the plane of occlusion, I'd say this is absolutely a complex case. My first question is gonna be how old is that veneer? And if the guy says eh, two years, I'd say, oh, okay, yeah, we've got a problem here. I can see why this tooth chipped. Look at the plane of occlusion. Look at how this person must be going into their, their functions, their envelope, envelope of function. It would be a mistake for me to diagnose and treatment plan this person who's asking for a veneer. Hey doc, throw a new one on right now. I don't have to do any convincing, they're ready to go. But even in this case, what I did is I get him into a provisional veneer. And I say, I'm not making a new veneer for you, my friend. We're not gonna do that. There, We've just met, there's a lot going on here and we need to figure out, I already have some ideas, why that first veneer chipped after only a couple of years. We need, may need to change this treatment plan so that it'll last, our solution lasts a heck of a lot longer than this two year veneer that, that, that's going on right now. And so the purse, I addressed the concern, he walked out with a full looking tooth, but it's provisional material. And I haven't locked myself into uh, a bet that my veneer is gonna last longer than the last guys. My point is, is you, you, you can address the patient's concern without locking yourself into certain courses of treatment when you haven't had the time to properly diagnose and treatment plan. 
Uh, very quickly, I'll just uh, drop in on bad sales techniques that I've seen. And unfortunately, um, sometimes it's it's mentor dentists or where you go to practice. Um, it doesn't matter what practice model you're in, but I've seen uh, plenty of examples, unfortunately, of, uh, of, of groups that will, will employ some of these bad sales techniques. They do not create trust. They do not create confidence. You may get a short-term score, a couple more cases, uh, but it's not the best in the long term. If you want to see an example of this, look at Dollars and Dentists. I think it was a frontline uh, documentary. Dollars and Dentists is the name of it. You can Google it. And it just talks about how uh, dentists are influenced. And they talk about corporate dentistry and they talk about all these different things. But you'll see on camera live a young dentist associate working at a place. Doesn't matter where. You'll see for yourself if you watch it. And this person starts to employ some of these sales techniques. And I genuinely believe this dentist thought they were doing the right thing and were, were helping this person, but they, because they had been trained by this institution to present cases this way. Upselling, bait and switch, the hard sell. These are those kind of uncomfortable, mm, this doesn't seem right. If your gut's telling you that the way you or your treatment coordinators are being told to present care to patients, if it just doesn't seem right, you're probably correct. And, and there's names for some of these techniques. Uh, in Dollars and Dentists, you'll see a, a great example of upselling. So the person comes in, this patient comes in for a denture and it's advertised only $300 or something like that for a denture. And so the dentist is, is saying, the young dentist is saying, well, that, yeah, $300 for the regular denture. But act now while supplies last, we can do the deluxe denture, and that's only $9.99 for only blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. It's, see, if it seems gross to you, it probably is uh, one of these techniques, and we need to make sure that these aren't involved in, in the profession of dentistry at all. We should make sure that the way ourselves and our whole dental teams present care to patients is done in a responsible, professional manner, and that where there's nothing manipulative going on, and these are uh, three examples, you can dive, dig in deeper to see examples of, of manipulation. All right, let's jump into the consult with our remaining few minutes here. Uh, this is my consultation room. It's a heck of a lot more comfortable than that dental office, that dental operatory I showed you a few minutes ago. You can see why I like to move people to discuss more sensitive matters into a room like this. Yeah, usually you have degrees and awards all over the place. That's that's fine. But there's 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 very little in this room that is intimidating to a patient. When the patient walks into this consult for that second consult visit, uh, you can see I'll have the radiographs on the, on the computer. If we had took study models, that's up ready to go. Any clinical photos, I can pull those up. We can dance back and forth. Much more comfortable setting. I also have, you can probably see at the bottom of the screen there, there's a couple of chairs. I will often say to patients, especially if they seem like they're a little overwhelmed with options, I'll say, hey, you want to bring a friend or a loved one? Please do. I love another set of eyes and ears on this. We're gonna be discussing a lot of things. We're gonna take all the time you need to discuss them and make sure you understand them. But if you have someone that helps you make decisions like this, please bring them along. That'd be great, they're most welcome. Now, I love to do that for obvious reasons. It genuinely does help, but also I'm potentially meeting a new patient who walks in and goes, oh, this place is nice. And they seem nice, like nice people. Okay, the consult visit. Here's what this is, plain and simple. It is a 30 minute deliberate comfortable dialogue. It is a dialogue in that we are having a conversation. I am not getting on the, uh, uh, the soapbox here and just ranting at someone for 30 minutes about uh, showing them all of my dental knowledge. That's not the purpose. We're having a conversation, a conversation that will start with, with, with me just asking them questions to learn a little bit more about them. It's comfortable. We put this in a comfortable setting. There's no closers. They didn't just walk out of the, the hygiene room and now someone's coming in saying, now here's the dentistry the doctor told you about. Now sign right now and we'll take 20% off. Forget all that. That's nonsense. That's hard selling. We're not interested in that. This is comfortable. There's no pressure. They can walk out of here and think about it some more. I don't care. Deliberate. I am moving this conversation forward towards a purpose, towards them understanding and accepting treatment. But I want to be very clear here. I don't need the person to sign or accept treatment at the end of this 30 minutes. I don't need it. I'm happy and I feel like we've made progress if we've just eliminated some options, right? If we've just, if we've got 10 viable treatment plans and we've whittled it down to two, 
that's progress. And I'll tell the patient that, hey, we did a lot of good work today. Looks like we still have some decisions to make. Let's figure out what we need to do to make that decision. And it's 30 minutes. If it goes beyond 30 minutes, I, I, people tune out. I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's no, 30 minutes. That's it. If it's an hour, hour and a half marathon treatment planning session with a patient, you're, you're going to lose them. Now, I talked about this at the top. Our goal is to connect their wants to their dental needs. And you do that by asking questions. I love when I sit down, I just, I just ask people questions. I say, tell me a story. I'll sit down with, there's photographs of decaying teeth and, and infections and all this. And the first thing I say when we sit in that concert room, I say, tell me a story. That's it. And I shut up and I listen. And it'll be amazing what people tell you after that. Based on their response, you'll start to get an understand of their wants. I'll give you an example. This tooth has a story, right? This tooth has seen some stuff. There's a story here and I need to uncover this. So when I sit down with a patient and I say, tell me a story. If the patient goes, yeah, doc, this tooth don't work so good. I don't know. Uh, what can we do? I got to spackle this or something. Uh, can't we just figure that out? Anyway, I got to get going soon. That is, a, the patient has just told me a lot in that opening salvo there, right? I now have a good idea about how I need to maneuver to start getting this patient to value their care before I start talking about, well, the red complex has led to severe perio. No, the person didn't give a crap about that. Now look, the same clinical presentation, same clinical presentation. If I were to say to this person, so tell me a story. And now it's a woman who says, you know, I'm embarrassed to smile and it's hard to eat. And I put my children first for the past 20 years. And you know what? It's time for me now. I mean, come on. I, I, my heart's breaking thinking about it. And I've had women, men that have said this to me in cases like this. I don't need to do some, some grand persuasion here. They're already on board. Both of these are the same clinical presentation. My point is, is to get to know the person you're talking to, get to know the person that's attached to these teeth or barely attached to these teeth in this case, get to know them and have a normal human dialogue and help figure out how to, to, to explain their dentistry in, in ways that matter. Uh, again, my apologies that we, uh, that we started late. That is entirely on me. I'm gonna just skip to this little piece coming up here. The hurdles to treatment. Dr. Solaris. Yes. yes, go ahead, sorry. Um, so we can actually continue until 9.55. Um, I know we started a little bit late, so. Oh, like thank you so much. How nice, that's great. That, that'll, that'll be really great. Okay, I appreciate that, thank you. So. The three hurdles, the three obstacles to treatment. Uh, I've laid them out for you. It's money, it's time, and it's fear. Now, to no one's shock, the number one obstacle to treatment, this is from ADA research here, the number one obstacle to treatment is money. Look at this uh, research that was came out from uh, Dr. Brugisic from the ADA. Reasons for not obtaining needed dental care. Number one, could not afford the cost. Number one, by a huge margin. What's number two? Insurance didn't cover the procedure. Kind of the same thing, right? A patient's still saying, hey, it's I don't have the scrilla. Number three, didn't want to spend the money. Where, do you see how even the top three are all financially related? It's We have to go down to uh, number five here, afraid or do not like Dennis. Number uh, six there is too busy. That would be the time factor. So I have a lot of patients who, uh, I'm in a busy area of Long Island. I treat a lot of uh, my, the the patient demographic I treat, I call busy business people. They're like, I gotta be in, I gotta be out. They've, it took them 20 years to destroy their teeth, but they need me to fix it yesterday, right? It's not really fair, but it's still an objection that we have to contend with. I lay out the three objections here because we should be listening as we're having this 30 minute comfortable, deliberate dialogue with our patients. We should be listening for what kind of objection they're presenting us. And then we should be very careful to not introduce any objections that aren't currently present. I'll give you an example on that in just a moment. 
but think about, listen to what kinds of objections are being brought. Is it a time issue? I'm in a rush. I'm too busy. Is it a, I'm afraid it's going to hurt. I'm afraid it's not going to look good. Is it a financial one? We have pretty clear different solutions for each of these, don't we? Right? I mean, with the anxiety one, I can say, you know what? I understand. I Gosh, it's a lot to go through uh, for you. You've only had minor dentistry done, and now we're talking about some major stuff. And I tell you what, uh, I have a lovely, lovely patient who went through some care very similar to yours. And she's so great. She told me years ago that if anyone was ever in her position, she'd be happy to talk with them so uh, she could just address any of their concerns. Patient to patient, you guys could chat. Is that something you'd be interested in? Right? That is a unique solution to this problem, this objection, this obstacle to treatment. But you're not gonna know that that's the reason they said no or didn't come back for care or didn't make that appointment unless you ask, unless you start digging through that dialogue and finding out what is motivating that patient, including their obstacles. Let's see if this moves again. Oh, here we go. There we go. So this here, my friends, is hopefully worth the price of admission. This is my framework that you can start using right away to begin to overcome obstacles that you encounter with your patients. And yes, this does work for disagreements that you can have in life with your best friend, with your significant other, this works. It's just a way to organize your thoughts to be able to overcome an objection when it's presented to you. Thank means not just thank you for bringing this to my attention, although it can literally be that. Uh, you can literally say those words. Thank is also just acknowledging what the person said to you. Isn't it frustrating when you're complaining about something or you're upset about something and you feel like the other person isn't hearing what you're saying? Yeah, that's frustrating. So right off the bat, you let them know you heard them. Next, state your objective. Very plainly and clearly say, well, here's what I want us to do. Third, present your argument. Here's the reasons why we're gonna do what I think we should do. And finally, summarize. Kind of just restate that objective. Here's what we'll do with a little rallying cry. I'll give you an example using dentistry. Let's say you present a treatment plan uh, to do a filling, and let's say it's a $20 out-of-pocket copayment. And the, or $100 out of pocket copayment, and the patient says, Oh, that's really expensive. Sounds like you're concerned about finances. I certainly understand we have a lot of patients in that, in that boat these days. I'd like us to move forward with getting these fillings done. You see, right now, taking care of this tooth decay, eliminating this tooth decay is only going to be a $100 investment on your end. I assure you that unfortunately, if we wait, if we push this off for months and months, well, it only becomes a more expensive problem to fix. So why don't we take care of this now while it's only a $100 investment on your end? And I, I promise you, we'll find some creative ways to, to help you out and stretch out that payment so it's comfortable for you. How was that? Is that okay? Did you see how I move through the four stages, right off the bat, and this is the most important, sounds like you're concerned about finances. I use that all the time. Sounds like you're concerned that this might be uncomfortable treatment for you. Sounds like you're in a rush and uh, it's hard to, to book treatment. Say it right out and clear, and then say, but here's what, we're, what I think we should do. Now, the argument's where the magic happens, right? You get bonus points if your argument turns their objection around on itself. You think $100 is a lot? Well, wait till it's a root canal and it's $1,000 for a root canal and a post-core crown. Is that wrong? Am I, is that incorrect? No, that's factual. I'm presenting legitimate information to this person. If you think $100 for fillings are a lot, wait till it's a root canal. That's legitimate. That's not manipulative. Now, I don't say that, as you heard. I don't say that. That could be a little argumentative. But I say, listen, $100 is a lot to you. I, I understand. It's a lot to a lot of folks, but this is only going to become a more expensive problem to solve. So let's take care of it while it's a minimal impact on your, on your budget. That's legitimate. Now, what we really want to not do, as I was hinting before, is introduce new objections. Here's what you don't want to do. Sounds like you're concerned about finances. I certainly understand. Well, I think we should be taking care of these fillings real soon. 
You see, I promise it's not going to hurt. I'm really good at giving injections and it won't hurt you anyway. So let's sign up, uh, sign up for that appointment. And let's get this going. Bad argument, right? I haven't addressed the cost issue and I'm throwing in the pain issue out of the blue at a left field. Who said this was going to hurt? Why are you bringing this up, right? That would not be a, a that would not be a way of doing this properly. But I promise you, my friends, if you use this this little formula here, it just helps organize your thoughts. When someone says no to you, when someone says I don't want to do this because, it can be hard to figure out where to start, and you can just start to ramble. I'm certainly guilty of that. You just start to ramble. Oh, but I thought, well, but the cavities are big and uh, tooth bacteria is bad, and just ramble. I'll go all over the place. This will help you remain organized. Well, my friends, thank you for the opportunity to address you. We have a few minutes left for some questions. I, I think I saw some questions come up in the chat. I'm easy to find. Uh, that's my Instagram handle. I discuss a lot of these dental issues there quite a bit. And um, dental economics is free. So you can go on dentaleconomics.com totally for free. We don't want any of your information. And you can get a lot of this information available. Uh, I wish you the best on your journeys into private practice over the in the coming years. And just remember that you're never alone. We have wonderful resources from your local dental society to wherever it is. You have many wonderful resources to help you on that journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Salerno. So now we'll uh, spotlight you. And we do have a few questions in the chat. So the first question that I got several DMs about was, which intraoral camera do you use in your practice? And also, what are some good options that are more cost effective? Right now, I'm using Mouthwatch. Mouthwatch is a teledentistry platform. And they just also happen to have uh, really inexpensive, awesome intraoral cameras. So that's what I'm using right now. Uh, and bonus if you want to use the teledentistry platforms as well. Great. Is there another question in there? Did I miss that one? Sorry. No, that's perfect. Um, okay. So another question that we have is pertaining to students. So if you have a patient that says, is this your first time doing this procedure? And if in fact it is, what is a good way to navigate that conversation in the chair? Great question. So uh, look, if the person is in the is in the academic setting, like they kind of signed up for having dentistry done on them for the first time, right? So what I would say to them is, you know, uh, sounds like you're concerned about this procedure. I, I promise you, I uh, am very well trained for this. I've got my faculty right here standing over my shoulder. We're gonna get through this great. You're meeting that with confidence. Um, I would personally say, I wouldn't say, well, yes, it is my first time. Uh, you know, that would be true, but maybe, maybe, you know, you could probably see if you can avoid it. Don't, don't lie to the person. Uh, you know what I used to say, which is kind of funny. Uh, if I had done like a filling or something or a, a root canal and someone's like, oh, so is this your first time or how many times have you done this? I would say, I can't tell you how many times I've done this. See what I did there? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. I know we've probably all been asked that once or twice. Yeah. Definitely something interesting to navigate through. Um, so we probably have time for one, maybe two more quick questions. So one question that we have here is, when did you start with dental photography? Do you think it's important to incorporate this into our practice as students? Uh, I started in my, um, really was my, I, I was out for a couple of years. I, I dropped a, a thousand dollars on the camera that I just showed you earlier. Um, Canon, Nikon, doesn't matter. There's there's some groups out there. If you go, when we're allowed to go to dental meetings again, you'll you'll see there's a camera specialist just for dentistry and they'll put the right lens and the ring flash. They put the whole setup there together for you. There's also great courses. I think I mentioned Adamo Tor Antonio has awesome courses online uh, or in, in person. Um, uh, I'm not an expert photographer. I don't have all the fancy lights and I'm not like taking these gorgeous photographs to put online. I think if you just get a camera and do some basics, uh, you'll be able to have more effective case presentation, certainly from a diagnostic standpoint and treatment planning standpoint. Just taking a simple camera picture with your phone and, and blowing that up on a screen helps someone see their smile and start to identify what kind of issues they have. I will say, though, if you want to get into serious cosmetic dentistry and you want to be broadcasting online on social media, your befores and afters, then yeah, you should definitely take one of those more advanced photography courses. But if you're just using it internally for some basic cosmetic dentistry and, and uh, uh, stuff like that, then 
you don't need to have the courses. They're, they're cool to take it if you're really interested. Just get the camera and the ring flash and the telephoto lens and uh, some mirrors and you're good to go. Perfect. Thank you so much. So that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much for presenting and working through the technical difficulties with us. We really appreciate you being here. Um, everyone, you can follow Dr. Salerno on Instagram. I'm sure he would accept some DMs if you have more questions. Um, but for now, I will stop the recording and everyone can go back to the general session for our next presentation. So Thanks, thank guys. you again. Thank you, Dr.